you got a computer. Okay. Yeah. All right, recording um, has started. No, no, actually. Yeah, okay. Everybody done? Mm -hmm. Okay. Somebody else is, um, please mute yourself. If you're... Okay. You're already connected. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now we're going to start the project. I think, uh, again, we talked about the, the healthcare market, the provider market, payer market, academic institution, life science, and briefly went over the pharma. I think this was important for you to understand how they interact with each other. And then I, then I basically what, what we did, we went through the overall market. Yeah, the segment. That is, is oh, okay. Hey guys, okay. Um, can you? Hey guys, can you mute yourself? Could you, could you, could you mute? Um, yeah, there's a lot of background noise. Frank's Thank you. Frank's actually giving a lecture. Okay. Has he already started? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes, he has. I'm not in the, I'm not in the thing yet. I already... All right. Uh, let me let me kind of go through this because I did not record the last sections. I want to make sure everybody understand this section. So the way I looked at the market is that market at the core, you're going to have patients who may never go to the uh, to the hospital, an acute hospital, and so hospital are really a kernel of the final final stage, or unless you get really sick or get injured, you go to the hospital. But then the after the hospital, there are ambulatory care setting. These are the really clinical setting that that technically mostly focus on primary care and um, uh, in the area of basically chronic disease management or, or ob and uh, obstetric and gynecology stuff. And, and then when you get to, get to the specialty, oops, I keep touching the wrong button. When you get to specialty care, when you get to specialty care, um, it, it is important to note is that there are, there are these um, uh, urgent activities where people are hurty, they, they really want to get a quick uh, quick uh, relief. And there's activities going on right now inside the pharmaceuticals, uh, like if you're going to even in the um, drug stores like Walgreen, you're going to see some clinic in the background and sometimes they have actually clinical persons there, which actually plays almost the role of urgent care. And I think then, then it's, uh, the specialties are really those specialists like you could have cardiologists, you have very com complex care, care activities, they're fo for, uh, focused on that. There are, there are really sometimes even a surgery centers, you know, special surgery that happens in, this, uh, in those so-called specialty cares. Then you come into the payers and insurance company. These are really entities who really pro process the money. Remember, sometimes you get insurance, but technically speaking in the U.S., about 60, 55% to 60% of the revenue is generated by the payers from government. And the same payers who actually get the claim, they also become a middleman to actually move that data to the, to the government and, and, and collect the money for the hospital or, or be there a, a basically gatekeeper for the insurance company. Then you have um, uh, the pharma and life science research. Again, this is a, a Kind of outside of healthcare, but but they really have a major effect in the healthcare. They, there's a lot of big money is made there. There are some pharma's activities that are regulated, and they have to go through this uh, phases of pharma um, evaluations. And then there are some farmers that are not regulated because basically uh, these are off, uh, off the shelf activities that people deliver. Again, it is a big sector, and then finally. Um, the biggest one of all is consumer sector, where right now, as we get to the end of this class, I will kind of explain to you, you know, why I put Apple as one of the potential uh, evolutionary model is because of that whole consumer area. You know, people wear that, you know, their Apple Watch, you know, they, they, they start collecting data now, and, they, and this, this is getting more and more uh, so-called effective in actually collecting data around the consumers. And then obviously for the real old and geriatric, the home care and monitoring patients at home. All right. So again, we, we talked about the standard coding system. We went to this different coding system. We talked about ICD, we talked about the ERG, we talked about the SNOMED, how they were used, we identified in the location we used. We're gonna repeat that a little bit more later on. But again, the most important part that I try to express is that the concept that I identified for you, DX, TX, Rx and HX, and, and really, 
here you can see what is the diagnostic for DX treatment is TX, medications RX, and HX are history. The, the reason I put it this way, because I want to make sure you understand these silos. These are much bigger silos. There are subset silos inside these silos of, 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 of data collections. But at the end of the day, for example, lab is probably a subset of a TX. For example, when you go to a doctor's, you order some, you, you identify diagnosis. Doctor either trying to rule out the diagnosis, they order some lab to identify what, what they're ruling out, or the doctors actually may actually order something to really monitor the treatment that they have assigned to you to see if that treatment is applying the right regimen to your outcome. You know, is it stabilizing your blood pressure? Is it reducing your cholesterol? And so on and so forth. So those are treatment-based treatment, but the lab results are really results of the treatment. We call it orderable. Uh, when an order gets done, we say performable, and then we talk about results, which is lab, and, as an example. Radiology is another result. Um, uh, clinical and pathology is another result, result. Allergy is really, again, one of those findings that kind of falls into the diagnostics eventually as part of the thing that doctors want to follow. And then, um, and then you have this inpatient billing and provider billing, which is inpatient means the whole hospital bills for everything in a hospital. Provider billing is what is that doctor's, how that doctor gets reimbursed. He can get in reimbursed outside in the, his clinic when he sees you. But if he comes and visits you in a hospital or he does a surgery in a hospital, he also bills for himself separately. And those two different differentiations are very important. One is really compile around this team work around the hospital when it is compiled around that provider's specialty and his work that he does. And then ancillary services billing is that when you order lab, lab companies have to make the billing and support the billing. All right. I, I kind of repeated this guys because I really want to make sure that you understand the big um, big picture and where IMO is playing, why our terminology is playing. We talked about some of these coding system. I think you know the you know, we have documentation online, you can read about them. And then we, we really, I, I try to, um, the, the whole concept of, uh, and I just basically went over that, the diagnostics procedure, diagnostics text goes to orderable, goes to performable, goes to results. And when it gets to results for that results to be built, they have to connect to that result a diagnosis. So when you do diagnostics and treatment, because results, is a variable for a for result, but at the end of the day, when you're trying to uh, um, identify that, the value of that for, for reimbursement, you have to identify diagnostics and treatment. And then medications, obviously, we all know about medications. You know, medications, in, historically, they've been a little bit loose, but now it's becoming more effective because they are expecting the provider to identify the diagnosis. You know, pharmacist is not going to dis disperse the medication to you unless the diagnostic is clearly defined. And, and that's becoming, a, again, one other way of actually being able to justify it. And history and a problem list is that when a diagnosis is identified, and if that diagnosis is, is uh, basically is in testing mode and, and in monitoring mode, it becomes, goes into a problem list. Well, when that diagnosis is is resolved, then goes into the history. Or when that diagnosis is a family history, you know, some family member had it, goes into the history. So again, the problem list and history are kind of side by side. History is usually, is really a part of problem list, but the problem list is really what's called current history. And sometimes they say um, history of present illness, usually history of present illness it normally results into some item that go into the problem list. So you can monitor the patients over time, okay? Then one of the things that I wanna make sure you understand, when you work with medical record, you have some responsibility. Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, basically if you become, if you access to patient chart as part of your job, and you by mistake reveal that to somebody, there's some serious jail time, okay? I'm serious, very, very important. There are HIPAA requirements, there are rules and regulation how to manage that, and you gotta be very, very careful, especially if you guys are gonna do internship with us, you may get exposed to the HIPAA, you need to immediately notify the people at IMO that, oh, 
this record that I had had some patient information on it to make sure that you know we um, uh, do not get penalized for somehow some way exposing something that is uh, patient's uh, privacy is exposed. Okay. Again, these are the additional coding system. We talked about these later last week. We talked about these codes. I think we, I'm not going to go through all of them. I try to order them as part of importance, you know, CPT, DRG, DSM, and HECPIX, um, and, then, and, and so on and so forth. And I start trying to identify some of the communication mechanism as well. So now we briefly talked about interface terminology, but I want to go into more detail in interface terminology. All right. Before I jump into the interface terminology, any questions so far? Anybody wants me to repeat anything from last class since I didn't tape it? Everybody okay? Yes. yes. Thank you. Okay. Interface terminology. So what we have done, you know, you have like ICD-10 for diagnostic space has 70,000 terms. And SNOMAD for diagnostic space has 70, about 90,000 terms. The problem is, the patient's problem, patient diagnosis, we have just for that space 800 different concepts. 800,000 different concepts. That's, that's significant, almost a million concepts that it really monitors all these different coding systems, all the variations. So to really make sure that that clinical intent is captured, we take what doctors say, which, you know, in COPD, for example, and then we let him say it the way they want to say it, and then we map that to a concept, and that concept then gets mapped to the corresponding coding system. So in this case, for example, these five entities really have the same meaning, but they're real different descriptions. They have their own concept, and that concept then allows us to map those descriptions to multiple codes in the target. Okay? So it is, it is really almost like a master, um, is, is a uh, many to many descriptions, and the intersections, the relationship is the concepts. Okay? That concept allows us to now look at that and then we move it to different, um, different coding system. Sometimes that concept may not be good enough. We may have to split that concept in two concepts. And then when we split it to two concepts, some of the codes go to this concept, some of the code goes to that concept. And we have to do, be able to do that because some of the, inter, some of the interface term goes to one concept, some of it goes to other concepts. So that, con that, that process of managing terminology is, is, is very important. So what we do, we do all that electronically by using our concept architecture to manage this complexity. When the doing the ICD-10 transformations, when, we, when the United States went from ICD-10-CM, CM starts for, stands for clinical modifiers, to ICD-10-CM, to ICD-10 clinical modifiers, we had, and they went from 16,000 term in diagnosis to almost 70,000 uh, 70, terms in ICD-10, we had in one release almost 1 million changes. Those changes were because of all these concepts, because of all the different mapping that we have. So we, we had to really be able to uh, present that, disseminate it, distribute it across all the hospitals that we have in the US. Again, um, granularity associated with terms to make sure that the position description is captured. Um, term for lexicon, lexical, um, sometimes called descriptions, is important. So you're gonna you're gonna hear in our interaction with my team if you ever work with us in you know in a, uh, do an internship with us, we say all oh, term we gotta call lexical, we call problems. They really all mean the same thing. The lexical ID is a unique identifier that we get to each term. Every term that we model, we never change that unique identifier. You know, we may change the spelling, then we give a new identifier to it. You know what I mean? So it really is our way of making sure that we maintain that uh, uniqueness. External uh, building code, in this case, would be ICD-10, for example, or CPT code. Interface term is really an IMO problem. IT um, is one of the interface terms. We also have procedure IT as an interface term. In your case, for our, our projects for next year, we're only going to be focusing on problems, so just so you know. So we're not going to go too much detail to any other one. Reference terms is really a clinical uh, uh, area we call SNOMAT CT, where you basically, SNOMAT CT is a clinical um, uh, uh, 
terminology and, and is really created by, uh, by uh, College of Pathology and is now become the standard terminology for, um, for the reference terms. Reference term, when we call a reference term, we really identify it. You have these classes of disease when you want to do reporting, you want to do it by reference term because interface term goes into the reference terms and those reference terms are clinical and you can do the reporting and, and decision support based on reference terms. Pre-coordinator and post-coordinator. I'm gonna go into the, the, the demonstration of this later on, but pre-coordinator means that if I have a term and, and that term or that reference term may have a potential leaf, when you, if you decide to select a leaf that means the whole description pre is pre-coordinated. But if you start from the, the roots and you start selecting the item to get to the leaf, that becomes post-coordination. So pre-coordination means you have the full rules all identified with a single click you select it, but, but, the, um, but, but the re reference terms really means that you really have, I mean, the uh, pre-coordination means um, uh, you selected one, one click, post-coordination means that you actually and navigate through selections to get into the final term. Okay. Again, SNOMAD is international reference terminology, a standard coding system for reporting clinical data um, for meaningful use. Meaningful use was a concept that came about as part of Affordable Care Act in the United States, where the, the government said, you know, we're just not going to give you billing. We want to make sure that the work that you're doing on that patient has a meaning. And that meaning that has to have some outcome that can be measured. And that's what the meaningful use means. So SNOMAD codes is one of the major codes that are used for reporting the meaning of the work to the government. Um, difficult to use uh, as an interface term because it normally is at, at, at a hierarchical level. It, it has, for same description, they have, they have to, I have to ca categorize it. It's very difficult to actually use it. Uh, so we have every problem term that we have is mapped to SNOMED and we can handle it, okay? Let me give you some example of diagnosis and standard codes. Here's an example of diagnostic score for IC10 and IC9. IC9 was old, IC10 is new, IC9 you have, you have three to five digit identifying it. Um, and, and this is basically kind of tells you why these codes were identified, why these numbers were assigned. And same description, for example, um, when is in that assessment may have a different code, and when it goes into the history, we'll have a V code, which is the, basically a, for a history code. So the reason those codes were assigned is because these were epidemiological use, meaning that not only IC10 and IC9 is used for so-called um, reimbursement, in most cases is used for by CDC for epidemiology to identify the group cohort of diseases and, and events that are happening in the, in the healthcare uh, in the country, okay? Now, there's the, these are diagnostics and for procedures, it's really IC10, IC9CM really did not separate the different coding descriptions for uh, procedure, it was embedded into IC9. But in IC10, there's IC10 PCS for procedure code. And again, this describes how they're organized. You're not gonna be tested on these two things, just wanna make sure you understood how it works. What, what we do at IMO, we actually, to support our electronic medical record, we support all these coding systems, you know, allergies, we, we try to create data sets that we distribute that is mapped to these coding and standards so these organizations can report their meaningful use, report, report cases, these organization can map to the billing code and get reimbursed. And these are the example of, um, of different coding classifications and IMO domain that we monitor and manage. Again, where they fall into, you know, problem IT, usually you have a SNOMAD code, you have potential for IC10 for Canada, IC10 for Australia, or IC10 International, which is WHO. We have to deliver all of them because when that interface terms, because our, our clients, our electronic health clients are in UK, they are in Australia, they are in Singapore, they are in China, so we have to be able to deliver that to them. Um, not Chinese speaking, but we, we are right now working, trying to get into Hong Kong, uh, 
where they actually the hospitals are are um, are using the using the uh, English species. Okay, then then you have procedure IT, which is you have a SNOMED CT, uh, a SNOMED CPT, HIPFIX IC10, and LOINC IC10 PCS, and so on and so forth. And medication, RX norm is a standard that government provides. Um, and then there is a um, there's a there's another one called um, uh, which is for documentation is RX norm. But normally for dispensing medication, there there are called NDC and I. I apologize, I did not have NDC in this uh, list. And social history normally falls with the SNOMED, and then there's a lot of characteristics in the SNOMED. We have it all mapped to SNOMED. Again, these are some other aspects of our, our, of our coding mapping. But you know, at the end of the day, when you get to all this coding and organization map mapping, what, what it comes down to is two things. How do you get paid? How do you report care? You get paid with ICD 10 CM and CPT. That when you combine those, you map it to DRG and, and HCC, which is a scoring card, a scorecard for severity. That a lot of the, a lot of the hospital, a lot of the clinics, and a lot of the regional um, uh, places in the states, in the countries are going into a model called capitation model. When they capitate, they say, okay, we're only gonna give you $1,000 for, for each patient that lives in this community. If for you to get more than $1,000 for a given activity that happens, you have to identify the complexity of that patient. If that, if that population complexity is higher, then you can justify asking for more money to care for that population. Normally, that is, that is that identified by hierarchical uh, uh, classification codes, which is really identifies the the severity of that population um, in the system. Then you really have um, in the outcome base you have the SNOMED, RX SNOMED, which is medication, and LOINC, which is lab. And then there those generate these so-called quality uh, um, clinical quality measure as the tables, and there's a whole bunch of reports under that that are produced. Some organizations actually even allowing the users to use ICD, CPT, and DRGs to actually report on some of those requirements for quality measures. So again, I want to make sure you understand is a dollar is important and the quality is important. And we're going to be focusing on those for the terminology of use. I'm going to briefly just give you a little bit on SNOMED, how SNOMED works. Here's a hierarchy of history disorder you could when you have a history disorder you have a hierarchical history disorder goes into allergies goes into ear disorder goes into blood disorder so if you want to do analytics and you say i want to do a slice and dice and say i want to find the, um, all the patients who have blood disorders you grab onto that particular node and start doing your uh, basically a grouping on that disorder if you say no i really want the history of patients with the ear disorder, which are uh, chronic and uh, chronic infections, meaning that they con continuously infected, and that then you take that note. Now, under that note, there may be a, you know, I would say maybe hundred thousand terms, and hundred thousand diseases as part of interface terms. So now, by doing that, you're grouping that you can do anal analysis. Okay, you guys follow that? So is, is SNOMED is hierarchical, that's what it's called reference, and is usually used for reporting for clinical findings. And this is another example how it really kind of <coughs> can identify. And, and basically, um, we, 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 we try to kind of group these identifications to make sure people understand how these codes are used. And this is a class, you know, how the histories are classified under them, and, and there's a whole bunch of terms that kind of fall into it. So when you get into actually get a clinical data and start doing slicing and dicing, you need to always understand the dictionary. You need to understand where those reference dictionaries are. You need to understand where the building dictionary is, how you report on, on it. What IMO does, we try to manage that complexity in the background, meaning that 
when IMO is using electronic medical records, they don't, the user, the doctor doesn't, doesn't have to know about ICD-10, doesn't have to know about the SNOMA, doesn't have to know about any of that stuff. He or she, all they need to know is they need to know IMO interface terms. As soon as they get IMO interface terms, we map all the stuff in the background for them, okay? And that's by far is the most important gift that we bring into the market. So this way, as the medical knowledge changes, and that interface terms have to be mapped to something more specific or new description for more specific comes, we model it for them and they don't have to worry about it. Okay? You guys with me so far? Yes. yes. All right. Okay. Capturing clinical intent and reading is what we do. We want to make sure that whatever, whatever doctor says, which is clinically correct now, it has to be clinically correct. Whatever doctor says, we want to capture that, okay? And then we then make sure that if we do not have that term in our, in our corpus, we then model it and deliver it to missions. That's why for diagnosis, we have 10 releases. And if you look at all of our domains, we have 60 releases a year, okay? That shows you all the overhead that we go through all the time. So we're really looking almost like agile development. You know, our terminology is like agile development. We constantly change it. As medicine constantly changes, we change. Now, regulatory systems normally don't change that much. ICD-10 changes two times a year. CPT changes. Now they're going monthly. But they're not that fast. We try to keep up with their changes and our own changes. All right? Now, the external code set is really what we do. We try to maintain and, and make sure that all the external code sets are, are covered. And billing code set has to be covered, and we want to make sure that, that we identify that as the most important situation. Okay, each IMO problem term is mapped bare minimum to one IC10 code. Okay? In the case that the disease that are identified is a complex rule that may is can be built by secondary code. We also identify the secondary code. Same with the SNOMAD. We always have one SNOMAD code for every mapping, but there may be additional codes. As part of your lab, one of the things that we're going to ask you to do is to really use the software that we give you, look at the payload, and then maybe select some other pay element of the payload and display it. Nothing fancy. But what I want you to do to understand when that term is searched for, when the term is clicked on the screen and you select it, it comes with the payload. And that payload is the golden goose, okay? It's all the mapping of that information, okay? And then making sure that those codes are, are, are maintained. So here's an example. The term is carcinoma breast cancer stage one uh, estrogen receptor positive. As you can see, it mapped to multiple SNOMAT, but one of them is a preferred code, okay? But the rule is really three things. You basically have a dynamic rule here. So this term, if you have the term and you have all the mapping, you can now do complex search on this particular term or, or trigger complex rules at the point of here. Here's another example bilateral knee pain, where you have a, a potential situation where you have primary code and other preferred code associated with that. And again, objective here is to make sure people don't misunderstand it. So how does it work? Let me show you an example. Here's a search engine. I go to a search engine. I select the co code. When I go to the code, when I select it, voila. Here is is example kind of post-coordination model, very quickly, post-coordination. And, and I want to make sure you see, you guys, you select it, it will then, in the bottom, as you can see, here, I identify final selection. I could have selected that right at the beginning and not have to go on through this stuff. So you will learn this. We, when you have this arrow here, that means there's a potential post-coordination that we can actually select, and so on and so forth. And then we, when you select a plus, it's automatically selected. So if you know, so if you really look at it here, if I would, if I wanted to select the diabetes, if I want to select this one here, I would just click and select it. 
But what happens in the background, I give them a payload with all the information associated with it. So now, or I can go here, and, and this is another model that we have, which is really now shows you a graphic model of how these terms are selected. Remember now what's going on, guys. When you have concept-based architecture, and when you have a terms which have potential multiple um, um, uh, branches associated with it, there is a dependency among these terms. And, and if you're gonna build the rule, if you're gonna build any kind of machine learning to understand what's going on, you have to be aware of that. And you have to be aware that with each of these codes are not just independent. And you need to be understanding that dependency. So as you get into your machine learning and knowledge base, and you run into the healthcare content, you need to be con cognizant of that. And IMO is the best source of that kind of um, exposure. We reveal all those dependencies because we give you multiple codes for every time. So the problem in healthcare right now is, technically you have a doctors and patients, you know, you're supposed to go into uh, enterprise um, EPR, uh, you know, try to connect the clinical data warehouse or clinical storage. You think that is easy? It's really not because there's sometimes there's the documentation in the middle to be able to get there. And, and there are other data that comes from multiple locations that come in there. But the bottom line is what happens is that you want to get the data from legacy data. You, get, you want to get the reporting to be comprehensive. So most of the electronic documentation to create in this data repository for the hospital to do reporting. But guys, you don't know what just happened. What just happened, because of Affordable Care Act, you guys are pioneer in next evolution of healthcare. Because the Apple service that they just came up with is the same thing, but for single patient. What they have done, they said, you know what? I'm a patient, give me all my data, let me, this repository that you're creating in, in a hospital, I want, I'm gonna build the infrastructure to allow all that data come for me into my Apple phone. Now, it's in a primitive state, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of problem with it, and those problems are things that IMO can solve. And again, what, what those basically, multiple documents, various formats, various formats, you know, you can resolve that. You know, um, they, you know they're, they're, there's, there's a lot of aspects of social media data to understand and how that data gets together. But the bottom line is when the data gets transferred, it's captured in a really a good, clean way and color form and high resolution. When it goes in transformation, they lose it. You remember that I had that one primary code? Many of the EHR only select one of those codes. But they pass the description, it goes into this you know, basic a repository. But what we can do, we can actually use IMO, take that description, and then automatically identify IMO code to it. Voila, you get all the color back. You get it? Are you guys with me? This is very important because as that data comes into that uh, Apple portal um, um, machine, uh, iPad uh, or iPhone, as it comes there, you can override it. You can go on top of that and then take those descriptions that are will come into interoperability, add IMO code to it. Suddenly, you get all these colors for the patient. Now you can add additional value to that patient there that nobody could do. And this is the beauty of IMO. This is the gift that IMO brings into the market, and it's very exciting. And the reason for that is very simple. Here's an example of, of breast cancer metastasized to a pelvis. It, if you just go there, this is a code that you're going to get in the, in, in, the, in the patient's data. You get a one code for ISD-10, but if you have the description code, what we have, we give you all those the SOMAC code, all those ICD-10 codes. Now you suddenly can develop some real nice rules for that patient. You know, if they're, if they're, if they're going into treatment for cancer treatment and you know, there was this cancer company who just just was bought for two billion dollars. Okay? This is be the, you know, be like a, as a boy, be as a boy, yeah, be as a boy. And so, so that tells you, and, and we just basically created the mobile app 
service for treatment and management of cancer. Again, not basic, but but the bottom line is there's a there's a there's a lot of um, gold at the uh, at the end of that uh, rainbow. Uh, so so given that, what's happening? Here's the HIE, how the HIE is working, and we're really makes this stuff happen for Apple to be able to collect that data. And the way that HIE happens, their primary care, there's hospitals, their registries, their radiologies, their laboratories, they all have to, as part of affordable care, have to feed that into the HIE. As the HIE goes back, you know, you basically, if you combine that, if you can normalize the data there, it's great. But you can normalize that data even inside, app, you know, inside the Apple app, you know. And so you can do the population here, you can do clinical decision support, or you can really have a so-called patient-specific value-based service that you can create. We are really in the in a really uh, amazing pioneer time, um, and I and, and I really want you guys to understand if you go work for Apple, or you go work for um, uh, uh, Google, or you go work for um, uh, for uh, uh, Microsoft, or you go work for Amazon. Trust me. They all attacking healthcare, and this knowledge of what you're gaining right now is very valuable. Okay, and being able to work on a on the lab and the exercise that we're going to give you is going to, and potentially the project in the summer and the fall is going to really move you to another standard, you know, level of standard deviation when you start working with your colleague in the front line. Again, um, this is uh, I'm going to give the control to David Alvin to show us, the, but before we go there, any questions? I'm gonna stop the machine, you can grab it, right? Yeah, I can grab it. Okay. okay, what David's gonna show you, I'm, I'm, as he goes through it, I'm gonna to try to explain. You remember I told you about DX, TX, RX, HX. Okay, we built a, 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 a like an example um, term chart to allow to demonstrate that. Okay, maybe you can man, take that coming up top here. of the screen itself. Uh, it's come up already. Okay, I can see. So I want to make sure you understand, guys. Let me explain what this is. So. Up here in, a, in the right hand side, up on top, do you see my mouse, guys? Or do I not see it? You probably... uh, they can't see your oh, mouse. I have a problem loading. Oh, that's nice. It just, I just had it loaded here a second ago. No problem. And this, with a face, you see that patient's name, age, and sex, okay? And, and then you're really identifying the patients here. Here, up here is a problem, which is really a diagnosis list of the patients and down here is basic assessment when patients are selected diagnosis to move to get billing so what's happening in the problem that's followed in the, in, in the care of the patients what happens do you actually build the patient here you have again both of them are DX here you really see the orders that was performed in, in the, for the patient and and then here in the bottom here, you see the, the so-called history of the patients associated with that. Okay? What would you like to do? Um, so we're going to show you how we go ahead and add a new di uh, diagnosis. So let's, let's open up a previous patient that doesn't have a lot of this stuff already in them. Okay, so now we have an empty set of quadrants to work off of. So we can add a new problem. Do you have one off the top of your head or should I just? Diabetes. Okay, that's what I was going to grab. <clears throat> okay, diabetes. And here, as Frank mentioned before, here's this uh, right handed carrot, which means that there's further modifiers that can be examined and added. So, off of diabetes, I'll make this a little bigger, hopefully. But apparently, the bandwidth is getting. So, besides just saying diabetes, it's saying, well, you need to specify the diabetes type. I'll pick type 2. And how about long-term insulin use? Okay, long-term insulin use. And we have 
<laughs> ophthalmic complications, might have retinopathy, and with diabetic retinopathy. And how about, uh, but it's non-proliferative and macular edema in the right eye. And as I was doing these, they're all undo the right eye. The options to select are listed down here. And then when I specify my last modifier, now I have the one that I'm looking for. It gets added to my problem list. I show them all the mapping was in the underneath. So if I detail, I don't think detail is it. This one. Do you want the, the payload or? No, it's the, the, that's, we can do the, the, the payload after that. So this is an example of, of shows you where it is in hierarchy, you know, associated with the, the concept hierarchy. And IMO term map to the selected, same selected ICD code, ICD code this is a snowmet code. So again, as you can see the detail of the knowledge that is really at your fingertips. So what that's what IMO delivers as part of the, the, the payload around this term. So go back, show the payload. And payload. Here's the payload, how it looks. This is what the search actually returns. And we're just storing it. This is unformatted XML. Sorry about that. You'll have to format it in your head. But just for this one term, this area that's under item, all of this is the information that we return from the search. And so in it, you'll see things like, I'm trying to find one here, um, SNOMED, secondary codes, risk factors, value units. Um, here's, here's a SNOMED US description. Right here, is that? So, so if, if you think okay. about it, we actually deliver these 10 times a year as they modified in our knowledge corpus and we distribute them. We actually trying to even make it on demand to be able to generate it. But it's, it's really a wealth of knowledge that is made available for you for that description. So as you get into your field, as you start working with your lab, one of the, what I was going to ask you guys is that, would you close that? Um, and I think um, George is going to show you how um, our programs work. We're going to ask you, basically, we're going to give you a, a simple search engine. And and what you see here says Rx and, and R and Rx, and there's a SNOMAT code. What I would like for you to do, instead of putting the SNOMAT code there, I was going to ask you to just change it to IC10 code, preferred IC10 code, that's all. So again, the objective here is for you to understand where it is the IC10 code is in that payload, to bring it out and change the title. And I don't want to really make it really wild for you guys. I just want you to understand the exercise of what does it mean. We're going to give you all the codes, so, um, so you know how to hit it. Um, so, uh, do we have George explain how to do the API? Sure. Okay. Um, George, uh, it's time to show them the API. George is going to show this with a fairly simplistic scheme. Um, George, I'll turn off my screen share so you can take over. Great. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, is everybody able to hear me all right? We can hear. Yeah. All right. Good. Um, give me one second. You'll be able to see my screen uh, momentarily here. And just give me a, a thumbs up when you're able to see it. It's up. Yes, right. So the, the document that I'm showing on my screen is just Swagger documentation for our, our RESTful API to access the, the problem and procedure content that Frank has been uh, covering for the earlier in the session here. Um, in terms of you know requirements for this sample app or you know lightweight integration that uh, Frank's requesting you to work on. There's a few different endpoints that will be important for your use. Um, so there's a 
search endpoint, which is when a user enters a search term and gets back results. And then there's two other endpoints, the item and the detail endpoint, which will, for a known IMO term, it will provide you additional details uh, for that term. So I'm gonna come back to this in a second, but I just wanted to kind of show a, you know, the live demo and kind of call out what's happening behind the scenes. All right, so let me just refresh this page. Um, this is another sample uh, portal. It's just a wrapper around the RESTful API that you could use to access our content. Um, so the user types in a, a term here, the classic diabetes example. Uh, I'm making a request to our, our RESTful API. Um, it's passing in a search term, diabetes. There's some other parameters that we'll cover uh, momentarily, and it's getting a array of problems back and then it's being rendered on the UI here. Um, so at the, the simplest level of integration, you would just need to use that search endpoint like we saw here. Um, I'll pull up a tool called Postman in a second here to show the actual request, uh, but I wanted to dive a little bit further, uh, further into this. So we made our search and we're presenting uh, information back to the user uh, and there's additional uh, things we could do. So I mentioned uh, the item and detail requests. Uh, those come into play when we do the, the modifiers that uh, Dave and Frank were showing earlier. So if I was to click this little uh, caret indicator here, it's making a subsequent request uh, to our API and saying, give me the modifier information to render these boxes to the user. Um, I think this is uh, possibly a next step outside the scope of the uh, initial ask that Frank had, but I just wanted to call it out uh, so you can kind of visualize what you're going to see on the, the API behind the scenes. So as I click through this, there's no additional requests being made. Uh, you only had to make that first request for a search, the second request for the details, and then once you get to a final term, you're making that third request to pull back uh, additional information. So you have your IMO description, ICD-9 mappings, ICD-10 mappings, and SNOLED mappings. The value you're seeing in this IMO column is that unique identifier we have for each of our uh, each of our terms, uh, and this is the value that you're able to use in the item and detail request uh, to obtain that additional information. So, any any questions about um, the UI aspect that I I was displaying here? Okay, so I, I, I want to make sure that everybody understands. Obviously, the lab on an individual basis is going to be very simple, but you can always surprise me. You can get out together, two of you together, and maybe build another UI or different UI and take advantage of, of the portal. I think we, we're going to give you documentation, we're going to give you examples, and all I'm asking is for you on an individual basis, just want to make sure you understand that on an individual basis to deliver me a result, a project, a um, report. I don't want it to be a, a cookie cutter type of thing, but the cookie cutter is accepted. But my hopes are that you can get a little bit innovative for me. You know, I, I like to see some innovation. Okay. Uh, but if you want to just to so I'm clear on my end, is the uh, initial request for this project just to have. Um, you know, some, some type of interface where a user could enter a search term and then display the uh, IMO descriptions and then the various code systems uh, yes. without, the, without the modifier workflow, is that correct? Correct, correct. And, and, oh. and without the selection, basically, they, they, when they select it, I, I'm okay with done. I mean, what I do want them to show, to show just less, a different column and be able to modify the column. All right. Question? Great. Right, so I'm going to kind of transition my screen here back to um, the documentation uh, that we were looking at. So I'll be sending over, I can send over uh, the link to this and some uh, test access information so you can play around with it uh, on the page we're looking at. Um, but in terms of just... It is, it is easier than, it, it is as easy as putting together Alexa in your house. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's a, a very simple API to use. So um, regarding the, the search, um, there are 
uh, a handful of different things here. I'm going to make this box a little bit bigger, but um, like I said, I'll provide information that you could use for authorization to, to test on your end. Uh, but the, the search request is very simple. Um, there's a handful of properties that you won't need to worry about changing, uh, but we could talk about them uh, very quickly here. Um, the first property here, use previous version. Uh, this comes into play uh, if you know, for some reason you need to access uh, a previous regulatory version of our content. So Frank mentioned two times a year, ICD-10 is getting updated and you know, new codes are being added, old codes are being retired. Um, if you're trying to document for the previous regulatory period, you would be able to set this value to true and retrieve those older values that were active uh, from the past. This isn't something you'll need to worry about for the, the sake of the demo. Um, the session ID value here, you won't need to worry about either. Um, we've implemented uh, some session endpoints and some event tracking endpoints that will improve our search over time. Uh, but for the sake of your, your sample here, you won't need to worry about that. And then uh, the next few things here you can play around with and you know, do a little discovery uh, about how to, how to use them. So number of results is exactly how it sounds. Um, it's the number of search results you'll get per search request. Um, typically, we keep this number very low. 10 to 20 results is plenty for a user to find what they're looking for. Um, you know, if, if they don't find what they like, they're just going to perform a slightly different search uh, and get back a different set of results. Um, this DYM size uh, is something we hadn't talked about yet, but the API does support uh, a did you mean functionality. So if I go back over to the demo here. Um, let me make sure. Are you are you seeing the IMO Anywhere screen right now? Yeah. All right. Good. So I, I entered in heart attack. I spelled it very poorly, and the API uh, gives me back an element that says uh, this is possibly what the user was uh, entering. So in our, even in our spell, George, you can even misspell the word attack, and it will still work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. There's, there's some logic in play. We recognize some misspellings here, and the API will you know, return a payload element saying, uh, there's these possible did you mean options that the user might have um, might have meant. Um, the API will automatically perform that follow-up search on the first item in an array uh, of did you mean items. So we present uh, indication to the user just saying, hey, did you mean heart attack? It makes it a little bit easier for uh, the user to process the results that are coming back um, if they didn't have a misspelling. All right, so this is just indicating the number of possible did you mean options. Like I said, we're just displaying one, uh, but there's five different possible options. You know, did you mean heart attack? Did you mean heart failure? A whole a whole bunch of different options would come back there. Um, the paging is which page of results do you want? So if you were to implement some paging functionality. Um, you'd be able to request, you know, results 1 through 10, 11 through 20, and so on. Um, but typically, we just see uh, one page of results is all you'll need. You won't need to implement paging of any uh, any kind. Um, the filter by precedence, you won't need to worry about for now. Uh, the big item here is the search term. Um, so this is the value that's being entered into the search box. All right. Yeah, so the search term is what the user will be entering. Um, those search results will be based off that search term. So this is what you'll be passing in from your search box or uh, however you're getting the uh, text into the search. Um, the next couple of fields here, uh, I, I wouldn't concern yourself with for the sake of the demo. We might touch on those a little later on if you know, there's some advanced functionality you're looking to implement. But uh, just quickly, high level filtering is if you wanted to filter by uh, any of the search payload attributes, you're able to write an expression uh, there, and it will only return results that you know, meet the criteria for that expression. Uh, distinct by is uh, similar to a filter. You're able to get a distinct set of results by one of the uh, payload attributes. So um, one of the common use cases of this is if you only want distinct clinical concepts, so you could say, um, you know, Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS, and you, know, you could only return the one that's closest to what the user input if you use that distinct by. Um, show fields, it's determining which payload elements will be returned. So 
as you saw on David's screen earlier, uh, the payload that you're getting back had, I think it's over 80 different attributes for each search result now. Uh, if you're only concerned with ICD-9, ICD-10, and SNOMED, you could specify those attributes in the um, show fields property there and only get those four things back because that's all you would be concerned with. Um, these next uh, next four are used for you know, tracking and making some improvements on our end. It's tracking the application that's making a request to the API, tracking the site. Uh, in many cases, that's a hospital or a, a clinic. Uh, ID would be placed in here, and then the user would be the actual user making the request. So you know, it could be a, an ano anonymized number, or, uh, you know, patients, first initial, last, or sorry, not patient, providers, uh, first initial, last name, possibly would be populated in that field. And then last for, for some uh, easy filtering, I would call it, um, you could enter a age and sex of a patient or someone you're searching for, and then you could set these filter by properties to um, to true to have a result set that's filtered based on the demographics of your patient. So that's the, the quick rundown of that search request there. I'm going to pull up uh, a tool called Postman. Some of you may be familiar with it. Um, but, and we could run through some sample requests and look at the responses that are coming back. Any questions about uh, this request, though? All right, so I'll pull up um, another screen here. Uh, are you able to see a, a new window, the Postman tool now? No. No. Oh, all right, one second here. I don't see it yet, George. Yep, give me one second. Here we go. Yeah, Good. Great. So um, I'll be able to send over uh, this collection uh, of requests. I have three three of them in here, my search request, my item request, and my detail request. Uh, like I mentioned, the, the main focus of what activity you're going to be working on is this uh, search request. So it's the same uh, request uh, body that we were looking at before, and we could quickly update um, a search term. Back to uh, I can hit the send button and then I'll get the uh, results at, uh, at the bottom here. So um, we do support XML or JSON and uh, the case David was showing, he had a XML payload. Uh, I'm requesting to get JSON back. Um, I find it a little easier to work with. So uh, both are supported. Um, but what we're seeing here, in my response is George hold, uh, George, hold on one second. Everybody, yep. are, is there any of these topics that we're talking about? The technique that we're talking is foreign to you guys? Uh, or are you following along with with the technology? Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I don't I don't suppose they're foreign. Um, might be a little bit rusty, but uh, we could uh, uh, just refresh everything. Oh, okay, you have done it before, you just have to get a refresh, you said, yeah. right? Okay, so you did it in the first year of school, now you have to refresh, huh? It's too too simple, huh? That's good. <laughs> That's good. Now, by the way, you can work as a team if you want to couple up together, but you got to be prepared that both of you have to be able to understand it. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry, George. Oh, no worries at all. So, um... We looked at the, the request, now we're gonna take a look at the, the response coming back here at the bottom of uh, the window. I'm not sure if I can make this a little bit bigger. All right, well, not me, but um, the first set of uh, attributes being returned here are just information about the request itself. So uh, the amount of time it took, uh, the size of the results, the number of possible results that would have came back. So I mentioned I was only requesting 10 results. Um, this, this attribute saying there's 8,000 possible search results for the term diabetes. So, um, a lot of, a lot of content we have there. Um, and then this other information down here, licensing information, uh, version information of which, you know, which version of our product are you on and, and so forth. 
Uh, and then we'll scroll down to this items array that's coming back. So these are the actual search results. Um, uh, each item in this array will be a search result. And in terms of you know, processing this, it's really taking a look at each item in that array. Uh, you would present them in the order they're coming back, so you don't need to do any sorting or anything like that. It's really first item in the array is the first search result that my user is going to see at the top of the list. And then it's really displaying uh, based on what your user needs to see. You could use one of these 80 plus attributes that I mentioned um, to display to uh, the user and however your interface looks. So um, just really quickly here, the, the title, this is the IMO description. Um, so this is the uh, text you would be displaying for the search result. Um, ICD-10 will be uh, present in the ICD-10 uh, code attribute. Um, the API is also going to give you the description for that ICD-10 code. So uh, if you had one of those uh, those terms that we were looking at earlier where there's three possible ICD-10 codes for one IMO concept, we have the ability to you know, display all of the ICD-10 codes to the user and display those descriptions so they're aware of you know, the various codes that are being captured. And then uh, I will send over a comprehensive list of what each of these attributes mean. I, I know we don't have time to go through all of them, but um, I think the big ones that we're looking at for uh, what Frank described are displaying the, um, the title attribute, which is our description, ICD-10, um, primary code, in addition to secondary codes, um, and then SNOMED as well. So we have the SNOMED concept ID here. Um, and then we'll get so, the... Guys, I, I, I really want to make sure you understand what we, what we have tried to do here is to really develop a platform in which innovation can happen. And, and, and for us to work together in the summer, I really want to make sure you understand this this is a fundamental you know piece of 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 basically certification to be able to be effective in IMO team. And I, I know from but your background and, and, and interviewing each one of you as you signed up that not only you can master this but more importantly you can also innovate on top of this. And that's why I try to give you some instructions at the beginning to understand what the interface terms is, what the mappings mean, so to be so you can be more effective in that process. That makes sense, guys? Yeah. 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 Excellent. I, I please I know uh, I, I want you to be very honest here because, you know, for you to, you know, to be part of a team, to work together, I, I want to make sure that at least you pass this level um, because it just makes you much, um, much more effective. Go ahead, George. I apologize for interrupting you again. Oh, no, no, no worries at all. So um, you know, that, that's it from the high level of kind of you're making a request, you're getting back an array of items, which are your search results. And then depending on what you need to display to your user, uh, you can pull out the different values here. Um, I want to move back over to another search request. So um, the diabetes one is pretty straightforward. Uh, if we move to uh, that carcinoma of breast stage one estrogen receptor positive term where there was multiple SNOMED codes and multiple um, ICD-10 codes, we could, we could take a look at how that looks uh, in a response. So in terms of um, you know, your title, that's gonna be that IMO description, which is more specific than the various coding systems. So you know, there's no single code in ICD to describe our clinical term that our users might be familiar with. And there's no single SNOMED code that could you know, have, have this level of specificity with a single selection. So that's the reason behind why we're adding you know, multiple SNOMED codes and multiple ICD codes. It makes the user experience much better. Uh, you know, do one search, pick a clinical term you're familiar with, get all the codes you need. You don't have to perform you know, five different searches to get both ICD and SNOMED. Um, but if we dive into this example now, 
here's my title I'd be displaying. If I scroll down a while here, I have my primary uh, ICD-10 code, which would be the one we're displaying on our UI. And then I could check my uh, secondary ICD-10 code attributes to see if there's any additional codes. So in this case, I have um, one additional code here. The secondary code is E17.0. This would be something that you would indicate to the user that you know an additional code exists, and you'd be able to display that to them as well. Um, in the search payload for ICD, you could get up to four additional secondary codes, um, but there could be even more than that. Uh, that would have to be pulled from an additional request to the API. So if I scroll all the way down here, we have an attribute that says uh, how many additional ICD codes are there. So the additional ICD count would indicate if you need to make that follow-up request. In this case, it's zero because we only had uh, the primary and the one secondary code. So you wouldn't need to make that extra request if you were trying to capture additional ICD uh, codes here. Um, for Snowman, it's a bit different. Um, in this case, we're, let me scroll up to the Snowman attribute. Uh, we are only returning the primary Snowman concept ID in the uh, search payload, but we have a similar attribute that indicates if we need to um, make an additional request to get additional Snowman codes. So. By looking at this term, I would know that I would need to pull back these additional codes from uh, that follow-up request to the portal. So uh, there's two additional codes that are present. Um, so I could pull that up. Any questions about that so far? Uh, just in terms of you know taking a look at a search result, finding if there's additional codes or not. All right. So I'm gonna. Yeah, I'm going to swap over to one more request just to, to show this really quickly. I know we're probably crunched for time here, but um, I did mention these item and detail requests. Uh, search is what you're going to be primarily using just for entering in text and uh, getting back results. But let's say I know that um, I need to get information about this uh, IMO lexical code. So this is the unique identifier for our term. You're able to pass this in. Uh, to the API in one of our other request types here. It's a much simpler request where it just says, give me an IMO lexical code. You pass in those same kind of tracking uh, properties that I mentioned for the search request. And this is going to pull back all of the information that we have for this particular lexical code. So it's a, a much larger payload than the first one we were looking at, uh, but it's, you know, designed to be able to get those additional codes if, if you need them. So I'm going to scroll all the way down here. Give me one second. You can see how much information is coming back for just this, this one lexical code. Um, all right, and then I'll arrive at this SNOMED um, element here. So. Um, you don't need to memorize all these names now. Like I said, I'll be sending you over there. <laughs> Uh, documentation here uh, as a follow-up, but now I can see that there's the three different um, SNOMED codes. The one that was in my search payload is here. It has a preferred flag, so it indicates it's the primary, and then those two additional codes that I would need to capture are also present. So you have your one code for carcinoma of breast, you have your one code for clinical stage one, and then you have your uh, estrogen receptor positive code as well. And you know, from my mind, it's it's all about making it easier for the clinician to document these things that they're familiar with. No clinician is going to want to go through and search three times to capture all these SNOMED codes using our portal. You get to a clinical term, and we you know map out to all those those code systems. So that's the Lovely. yeah, that's the good summary. There. <laughs> Job well done. So, gang, I think you know you see where we are now. Um, again. We have a week on this, and you know, even if it's but but please tell us what you have problem with. Work together as a team, you know, because at the end, all of you are going to be one team. If but I, but I want to make sure that you know you understand it, and you personally have gone through the experience and touched the portal and exercised the stuff that was just shown to you. Um, if you any of you have any challenge or the question please text us um, um, we I don't 
I will identify a hour for George to assign to you. I don't want you to contact George directly. You should go through IMO and we can then basically um, uh, connect you for basically a uh, visiting hour with, uh, with Joe. Um, I, have a, I have a couple of questions. Uh, first is, sure. can, we, uh, can we have an exact problem statement in sort of sure. uh, written form? Uh, that would um, uh, help us focus on the exact deliverables. And second, can we all work together as one single team? Or yeah. do you want uh, everybody to do the uh, deliverables individually? Um, I, I really, to be honest with you, I have no issue for everybody work as um, as a team. Um, but I want to make sure that each individual uh, demonstrates that they understand it. Mm -hmm. okay. And, and that, I'm not, work, sorry. can I chime in really quick? I'm not. How big is the the group of people that would be working on it? Like, how big is the team here? Uh, eight. We have eight team members. No, eight Shreel, uh, Shreel left. Yeah, Shreel left. So, so I think I, like, Frank, I might suggest having like two smaller teams like, split into two groups or something like that as opposed to okay. one big one. Okay. It might yeah, be a little that's bit right. that's eight, eight, eight is too big. You're right. Let's just sure. do four and four. You can you can do four and four guys. Okay, sure. Does that make sense? Yes. Excellent. All right, we will put it together and, 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 and please, you know, I'm going to ask each of you who are working in a team, make sure your other team member really knows what has happened. I mean, I'm going to get your guidance because you don't want it to be your team in the summer, okay, if, if they're not learning this stuff. You know, we got to pass this as a team and, and have that expertise to be able to go to the next stage. All right. A couple of details before we go. I'm going to be sending around a recap by email, which I've been doing every week. So look for that. The answers to this week's quiz will be in the slides, and I'll be uploading those after the session. Frank, um, when we end this session, the recording is going to download to your computer. So if you could send that to Anna afterwards, then we'll put sure. that on the SharePoint folder too. Okay. Okay, and right. then next week, the session will be again at IMO offices there at 4.30 p.m. And Frank and I will be there, I believe. Correct me if I'm right. wrong. And it's on Thursday instead of Wednesday. Okay? Um, it? On, the, on the email, it said 4 p.m., so is it 4.30? Right. No. Um, one of the students wasn't able to make it there by 4 p.m. because of their previous class, so we're going to move it to 4.30 to allow everybody oh, enough oh, time to get to Yeah, by the way, just want to make sure you know we will serve you dinner too, so so don't eat. So we'll, we'll definitely serve in dinner, so we'll have some party together. And it'll probably involve Bob knowing Frank, so. Yes. All right, now let me see. We have, we have right now Five more people, I don't see faces. Can other five people show me your faces now? I see your names. All right, let's make sure we get real people here. All right. All right, now we know it's real. Thank you very much. I hope this class is okay so far. Um, we love your, you know, your content, your comment. At the end of every quiz, we ask you for some comments. Please feel free to send those comments to us. All right, man. Thank you, guys. Hey, George, Thank you want you. to show yourself? At least I can see I, you, George. I don't have a Sorry. <laughs> I'm at, I'm at okay. home today. So. Oh, yeah. All right. No problem. Okay. See you. Okay, guys. Thank bye. You. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you, everybody.